Welcome to MHM Podcast Network on moviehousememories.com. Podcast for pod people. Our feature presentation begins now. You're listening to Lunchtime Movie Review from lunchtimemoviereview.com, and we are the children of the 80s. The children of the 80s are back with another review of one of our childhood favorites. I'm Patrick. I'm Bobby. I'm Chad. Hello, I'm Shane. And this week we're reviewing either 1981 or 1983's The Evil Dead by Sam Raimi and starting and starring the chin Bruce Campbell. Uh, but before we get into our little festive Halloween review, first a word from our sponsor. This Evil Dead podcast is brought to you by Ashes Necro Barbecue Shack. At <laughs> Ashes Necro Barbecue Shack, Ash will bring you the best barbecue found anywhere in the backwoods of Tennessee. The shack serves Cheryl's signature recipe barbecue sauce straight from the Necronomicon itself. This sauce uses only the ripest of tomatoes picked right off of Cheryl's dead corpse by demonic vines. This week's specials include Shelly's smoked chicken breasts. You will get two of Shelly's large, plump, hand-rubbed breasts, which are smoked and chopped to order with her very own Candarian dagger. If it's beef you're, you are looking for, you can bite into Linda's whole beef brisket. Her brisket is dry rubbed and fireplace smoked for 13 hours, then sliced to order. Depending upon how you like your women, excuse me, how you like your brisket, <laughs> you can order Linda's brisket lean or fatty. That's Ash's Necro Barbecue Shack where the patrons have been dying to get out since 1981, and the food is licking fingers good. <laughs> okay. Oh, my God. That, that's, that was pretty dark. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I actually don't know what brisket is. <laughs> Ask Chad. But I, I'll tell you now, I'm never going to eat it. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Don't give the address, Chad, because you'll have all kinds of people driving up to that place. <laughs> and that, you know, the Shelley's uh, breasts and stuff. Uh, I don't know. I'm not really into horse meat, so I, just, uh, <laughs> I mean, she oh, must oh be a part of the Sarah Jessica Parker family with that schnoz and everything that she had in that film. But all right, who has the summary this week? That would be me this time. All right. Bobby's going to break his cherry with a summary of the evil <laughs> yes, dead. Yes, sir. That's right. Are you ready? Shh, I, I, after that commercial, how could I be anything but ready for this? <laughs> All right. They are young. They are good looking. They are looking for a weekend of good old fashioned underage boozing and unprotected teenage sex in an abandoned cabin in the woods. No, not that cabin in the woods. This was long before Chris Hemsworth's cabin. This was well before Saw, even before that horrible Texas Chainsaw Massacre remake. Freddy Krueger hadn't even sharpened his nails before this movie came out. We're talking about the granddaddy of all gore fests. Driving an old beater of a car that barely survives the drive up the highway, but ends up surviving two additional sequels and a trip to the 14th century. These five fun-loving teens race through deliverance to their five-star resort destination in rural Tennessee. Driving across the bridge, Indiana Jones chopped in half in Temple of Doom. They have arrived just as the sun is setting. Suspecting the place may have a sinister past, the kids unpack the booze and nightgowns and get straight to partying. They find a creepy trap door in the middle of the living room with a chain on it. Instead of locking the chain permanently and getting the hell out of Dodge, they let the biggest male prankster take the only flashlight they have and disappear down into the darkness. Of course, Ash, the Chin Campbell, has to go down by himself to find the missing lad. After being spooked to within a whisker of soiling himself by his best buddy, they come across the Necronomicon, dressed as a pile of used toilet paper. Sitting next to the evil find are jars of moonshine, a tape recorder with all the answers, and a 12-gauge shotgun with a box full of shells. But no spoiler alert here, folks. The kids immediately sit in a circle and play the eerie tape with the Book of the Dead within inches of the fire. The tape 
just so happens to have every explanation and ancient incantation no human being has ever seen or heard for the last thousand years. But it stirs something evil outside that begins knocking over trees willy-nilly because of the overpopulation of pine and maple trees in the region. Instead of sitting in the middle of the cabin as a strong unit of five warriors with garlic necklaces, an axe, a chainsaw, and the twelve gauge between them, the kids do what comes natural to all kids who are faced with life-threatening danger. They separate into individual rooms and get undressed. It's like watching that Geico commercial all over again. One girl hears something evil in the pitch black outside the cabin and naturally goes out, alone, and ventures deep into the woods by herself, where she is summarily raped by the entire forest. I think she was planning her firstborn to be named Bud. She runs back to the cabin, screaming the entire way, but of course, nobody can hear her through the single pane glass that they are standing next to. She tries to get her brother Ash to drive her into town, but the bridge has been destroyed by dynamite that nobody heard from a hundred yards away. Unfortunately, the evil gave birth to Bud inside her, as the other kids run around trying to get away from the dead-eyed girl by, of course, running outside right where the evil is actually lurking. They, too, are possessed one by one, except for Ash, who spends more time giving the deadites some chin music with his fists and giving bookcases fall on his head. He fires his shotgun at deadite after deadite, only to find that there are no medieval screwheads who want to bow down to his boomstick. <laughs> Over the course of the rest of the evening's festivities of blood, ooze, and exploding white pus all over the cabin, we have one deadite chained in the basement that rots into a pile of claymation. Another is chopped into a million pieces in the living room with an axe. Another laughs like an annoying hyena before being decapitated mercifully for the audience with a shovel. Another dies, then lives, then dies again before melting into a pile of goo, and the Necronomicon is burned to within an inch of its evil life. All because some asshole who should have known better than anyone to not quote the exact words that bring evil back from the book of the dead. In the end, the sun has finally risen, the birds are chirping, the deadites are vanquished, Ash has survived by his chinny chin chin, and when all is right with the world, Ash is immediately attacked and thrown into the sequel, the end. Okay, take Bravo. a drink. Yeah, take a drink. My throat hurts just listening. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's just a, a thing I do for my kids. Oh, so. okay. <laughs> Time to go to bed, kids. <laughs> so when does their therapy session start? <laughs> I think it started a few years ago when I was reading them uh, Green Eggs and Ham with that voice. I don't think that really went over too well. All right. Uh, the Evil Dead was originally re- released on October 15th, 1981, where it, where it premiered at a film festival. It did not get a wide release until around, and it has various different dates for release dates, so it, I think it slowly w- was released, much like the children in Bobby's house, I guess, from time to time. <laughs> uh, on April 15th, 1983, the same day as uh, Lone Wolf McQuaid with uh, Chuck Norris and Shane's favorite film, Flashdance. And <laughs> <laughs> the same month as Losing It, Valley Girl, The Hunger, <gasps> and Something Wicked This Way Comes. I heard, I heard Chad take a deep breath in when he hears the term Valley Girl. I know he wants oh, to review yeah. that very badly. <laughs> Uh, it grossed $2.4 million. It was the 121st highest grossing film of 1983 behind such films as The Man Who Wasn't There, Table for Five, and Tough Enough with uh, Dennis Quaid, the one of like six of these films that I actually knew. And I just, liked that one. <laughs> so did I. And in front of Man, Woman, and Child, Merry Christmas, Mr. Lawrence, which I've heard of that film, not seen it, and The Droughtman's Contract. Uh, it spawned two sequels in 1987 and I believe a 1991 a television series a remake in or a re, yeah a remake in 2013 and a stage musical it was the best selling VHS in the UK the year it was released which shocked me is included in the, the book 100 or excuse me 1001 movies you must see before you die and Rotten Tomatoes has it at 95% critics and 84% audience so that's the numbers on the evil dead um, first, I'm going to start off with this. 
I have a confession to make, boys. I have never seen this film until we reviewed it for this podcast. I had. Oh my goodness! I own I, I, me either. Really? Okay. Really? really? I'd seen the other two, but I hadn't seen this one. I owned the other two, and I'd never me seen too. this one. <laughs> so it just it was like I I really like Evil Dead Two. I really like yeah. Army of Darkness, but everybody who had always talked to me about the film said, uh, you know, Evil Dead Two is better. And 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 it kind of implied to me that it's basically the same film, but it's uh, it's just a little funnier. And because I don't really think that after watching this one, it's funny at all. <laughs> but no, it's not the no, same not film. It's not the f- same film at all. It no, it is very much more of a. Because I was going, wait, there's five people. <laughs> Evil Dead Two. There's only one. <laughs> That's a big difference right there. So I, I I guess Chad, you had seen this film then since you were. E- yeah, I had seen the second one because I was told it was a horror comedy. So I watched the second one, and I'm like, okay, cool. It's really, really good. I uh, never got around to Army of Darkness. And then I'm sitting there watching the movie High Fidelity, or High Infidelity, whatever it is, with John Cusack one day. And he and Jack Black's character start talking about how Evil Dead 2 is much superior to Evil Dead 1. So I'm like, okay, I'm going to go rent the original one and watch it and see compare the two and yeah this one's much more the horror film compared to evil dead 2 but i guess to me it towards the end of evil dead you can sort of see the seeds if you will in the way bruce campbell's character ash is sort of fighting with um the dead and sort of in a little bit of a comic approach and so i think that was a seed that Sam Raimi picked up on and then went with to make Evil Dead too. Shane, was this in your little book of childhood reviews? No, I was way underage. It did get a cinema release in Australia in June of 83, but uh, I would have seen it for the first time on VHS back in the day, probably when I actually worked at the video shop. Uh, the general consensus was always that Evil Dead 2 was a better film, and I used to think that too, and then it was only a couple of years ago a cinema near me showed Evil Dead 2 on Halloween. I went to it after not seeing it for a long time and didn't like it much. It was good, but not nowhere near the memories of what I had. And then re-watching this original for the podcast, it had been a long time as well. And it's they're different movies. The, the consensus was always they were very similar, but you know one was funnier than the other. You're right, neither of them are really that funny, and... This one is dark and harsh, and even Sam Raimi has been quoted saying the uh, rape scene by the vines was something he regrets, but it's actually something that, you know, everyone remembers. And another surprise was this wasn't part of the video nasties regime, that mainly in the UK they had that list of movies that were banned, and I thought for sure, I just thought, you know, Evil Dead would have been on that list. It wasn't considered a video nasty at the time, so that became a bit of a surprise to me. You know, it, it's surprising. That just surprised me, too, because it takes a a lot to kind of bother me with a film, and I'll say I was a little bothered by the film, mainly because I was trying to eat lunch while watching it. <laughs> and, and it was like, that's, that's just kind of gross, and, and I'm not really enjoying my lunch, and I'm seeing this on the screen, and it 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 you know like gore doesn't get to me and it, you know does and mm-hmm. it doesn't frighten me it doesn't scare me it just usually is if, if something is just gore a gore fest it, it, it I, I kind of go eh you got no, there's no substance to it and this was unique and original in its concept but it was like wow that that's it's not blood gore it's like that's just like gross <laughs> shit <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Yeah, and that is one scene that I still think haunts me to this day, and I don't ever like watching that part of the movie because I it's just creepy as creepy can get. And if that's what Raimi was trying to go for, holy shit, he's got that the king of all's creepy scenes with that rape scene in the woods. Well, the and that's another thing I had heard about the rape scene for years, never actually seen it, watched it, and I went, okay, that it, it's a rape. I'm not trying to downplay rape mm-hmm. but right. it wasn't as graphic as i thought it was i mean it, it's still even more still implied uh, more mm-hmm. than it is actually uh you know actually shown and it you know i didn't i wasn't as uh bothered by it as i thought i would be seeing it and because i had read how sam raimi regretted it and 
that there are a lot of people who had problems with that. And I went, eh. I mean, in, if, unless someone would have said to me before seeing the film that there's she gets raped by, you know, basically the forest, uh, <laughs> I would have never jumped to that. I would have gone, well, I guess it could have happened that way, but I probably would have just, she never mentions it, never kind of goes over it. She just, you know, turns evil and, and then that, that's what it is. So I didn't find that that shocking. Did you guys? Well, I, I'd never seen the movie before, so I mean, I, I saw these in reverse when I was at the video store. Army of Darkness had come out, and I really loved that movie. I got a kick out of Sam, uh, or not Sam, but uh, um, Bruce Campbell, and uh, very much enjoyed that. And then I, I watched Evil Dead Two specifically because it was obviously the third of the bunch and two i liked very much but i never got back to number one because i had heard the same thing it had reversed where it went from comedy or rather from horror to horror comedy to comedy horror um with actually just a little bit of horror in it but um had i have known there was a rape scene in it i don't know i would have had a much harder time with it because it and this is a part where i think a lady's perspective would probably be helpful on a a podcast like this for this specific scene just to hear their perspective because as males we're obviously not going to have the same reaction to it as a woman would but um i i I think it was part of the movie i don't think that sam should necessarily sam raimi should necessarily be you know horrified that it was included because that it's this happens in other movies too um i don't know if he necessarily needed it to be as much as it was but i thought it was still kind of part of the story and the girl did eventually become possessed uh through something that caused it and i'm assuming this is it so it's one of those things that was needed for the the story to continue but it was still a little bit overdone, I think, uh, a little bit more. It it bothers me specifically just as a human being to see a girl go through that, and boy either, but, but a girl in this movie. What do you guys think? Yeah, you're right to a point. It's effective, and it bothers me a little bit as an adult, but it is a horror movie where almost anything goes. It's a low-budget yeah. horror movie, and it's a good old-fashioned retro splatter splatter movie so anything can happen and i agree she does mention it too patrick when she She comes back to the cabin briefly like i think she says something like it was the woods themselves they came alive you know no i know that i remember that but i don't remember her saying like i got raped by a tree Mm -mm. (laughs) no no, that didn't no that wasn't referred to in that type type of detail but yeah she did mention it and uh, yeah I, i don't know um it, it's very impactful, and it's definitely become a genre staple. This film and that scene has definitely got a lot to do with it. And I, like I say, I just see it as a, one of the more creepy scenes ever. I'm not saying I'm as shocked by it as I was the first time I saw it because I was sort of like, okay, this is different. Um, but to, talked about uh, having a female perspective. My girlfriend has watched this with me a couple times. And she's sort of one of those who said, you know, it is a shocking, shocking moment, uh, but she's of the mindset it's a horror movie, so you just have to, like, take it for what it is. And, yeah, it's disgusting and it's shocking, but it just is what it is. Um, and she's, last night when we were watching it again, she saw, this time around, she thought that uh, uh, Ash's sister was more enjoying it from her perspective this time around <laughs> than the first time she'd watched it so, really just based on how the noises came about so i was like okay and that's your her point of view so i just wanted to share that well i i in my research of the movie before we the podcast i had read that the actress ellen when she had gone to the screening her her parents they'd gone gone to the screening near their hometown and i guess all of the parents all the people knew each other and one of those comments was she was a little bit um squeamish about it because of her own family knowing that she had gone through it on screen and even the uh with her own children she didn't want to let any of her kids see it up until they were much older and could handle it so if if i mean that was her perspective and as the actress that went through it 
So it's just a movie, obviously, but still, it's it can impact real life too. So well, and, and you think of this as as much as rape is horrible, and I'm not trying to downplay yes. it. They mm-hmm. dismember a body in this film. Yes. Oh, man. <laughs> and, you know, a, a body of one of their friends in the middle of the film. And, and so, the, I mean, and you don't hear a lot of people complaining about dismembering a body. And that arguably could be considered much worse than being raped. And <laughs> is that if you get cut up into tiny little pieces. Well, not even tiny. They were pretty big pieces. But that you know that in the grand scheme of things is you kind of or i think chad just kind of mentioned is that it is a horror film his girlfriend said it's a horror film mm-hmm. horrible things are going to happen in it and that you know that i didn't think the rape scene was that atrocious as what is much, what i thought oh. it was going to be in my mind the, the accused is worse than yes this. yeah the oh, accused yeah. is is so difficult to watch leaving las vegas with uh, elizabeth shoe is yeah. so much more uh, difficult yes. to watch than this particular scene um, because as I said I think it's more implied mainly because there's not, not a person there I guess maybe that I'm minimizing it because there's not a physical person that you know what they're doing it's kind of like is right. is the, that root or whatever going up inside her or is this the rape scene that they're getting to and it's just I don't know I didn't find it as traumatic as I expected it was going to be uh, two, two of the things I actually remember uh, vividly watching it when I was a kid that stuck with me more than the rape scene was, was the banging of that outside swing that kept banging and banging and then it stops. Always really loved that. And then the pencil in the ankle. I just <laughs> thought, oh, that, that pencil would, would really kill. And um, I've seen it since. John Wick does it in John Wick, in the new John Wick film. So that was pretty cool. But that were, the, that were the two things that I always remember. And I reckon I would have seen both Army of Darkness and Evil Dead 2 before seeing Evil De- Evil Dead 1. I just can't remember the sequence. I saw it in. I did see Army of Darkness at the cinema, though, on release. Yeah, there's something about, like, pencils or something to do with, like, feet and ankles. That that yes. always causes me to cringe. The, a pencil in the right. foot or the ankle or, like, in Pet Cemetery when the kid cuts... Uh, um, yeah, uh, Herman Munster's uh, Achilles. That like, ah, oh, that's like the that's the most traumatic thing for that entire film for me. How do you feel about Bruce Willis walking across glass in Die Hard? Ah, that one doesn't bother me as much. Okay, so. I just had to ask. <laughs> I, you know, I've stepped on things. I've lived through that pain, but the idea of something in my ankle or cutting my ankle or oh, that, oh, ah. gotcha. Once she grounded in, <laughs> yeah, she did. <laughs> wow. Uh, you know, and and all the over a hundred episodes or so, I don't believe we've done a Bruce Campbell film. Not that he did a tremendous amount of films in the eighties, but I mean, he was he mainly has kind of done some more stuff in the nineties. Uh, what do you? you know, but I I still think of him as iconic. Uh, what do you guys think of Bruce Campbell? Uh, first of all, I've read his book, um, If Chins Could Kill. It was a good book and a great title, obviously. Uh, and he goes into a lot of detail with this and the other two Evil Dead films, plus other stuff that he's done. Uh, he's he's okay, but I actually, I mean, I don't dislike him at all. And I'm not sure that he would have thought himself that this little movie would have made him a pop culture icon that he is today. Uh, but in sort of the whole scheme of things, I think the girls of Evil Dead were a little bit more impressive and uh, significant than what Bruce Campbell is in this original, anyway. I totally agree with Shane on that one. Um, it, it And what was interesting was I read up on Bruce Campbell's history after this and, and through now, I guess. And even he said that he has a hard time watching the first half of the first half of Evil Dead One mm. because he was just learning how to act. He says I, I'm a little more comfortable watching the second half because and if you think about it, in Evil Dead, he kind of is background for the first half of the movie, a lot of it. Up until the second half, when he becomes pretty much the lone survivor and has to fend them all off by himself, is where he comes alive and becomes the chin that we all know and love. <laughs> and I have followed Bruce um, since, well, Army of Darkness made me an instant fan of his. And then 
like I said, I've watched backwards, and by then he had improved his acting ability. So, and I've watched Bubba Hotep, and I've actually just ordered um, My Name is Bruce, uh, which was actually filmed in Oregon, um, only 10 miles from where I was born. So, that was, it's kind of fun to have that touch um, with the guy, too, because to me, I think he, He's an over actor, but does it in such a tongue in cheek way that I really enjoy his delivery. It's not like someone that comes in from Shakespeare and decides that I'm going to do this schlocky, horrible horror movie for, and and I'm better than that. He's just the opposite. He believe he revels in being in these cheap, dumb movies and has a ball with it. And I see the joy that comes out in him and his castmates when he's in these movies. I'm one of the, I'm probably going to repeat a lot of what Bobby just said. Uh, Bruce Campbell to me naturally stands out in this film, his transformation basically from an everyday guy, like Bobby said in the background of the first half of the movie to the scared shitless survivalist is a brilliant uh, transformation in this movie as he does learn how to act, he is almost, to me, a one-man show in the second half of this film. And like I said earlier, this plants the seeds for him becoming a full-blown one-man show for about 90 to 95% of Evil Dead 2. I enjoy Bruce's work. I think he always does really good stuff, like Bobby said. You know, very tongue-in-cheek acting in everything he does. And um, Bubba Hotep's a good example of that. He has a lot of fun with his acting. And I would recommend anybody watch the TV show Burn Notice that used to be on. Um, He has a supporting uh, character in that uh, TV series, and he was brilliant in it. So I'm a big fan of Bruce's. I can't wait to read his book one of these days and hear what's inside his mind or read what's inside his mind. (laughs) No, I'm I'm interested what's in the book as well. I haven't read it, but yeah, I got you. I I think he's got a. I I think he's just uh, as you kind of said. He's he's very much he he knows what he is. He knows the character he plays, and I've primarily known him for playing Ash. And it's I I wonder how much the line is different between him and the Ash character in the film because I've seen him in all the Evil Dead films. I've seen him in the Ash versus the Evil Dead television series. I've seen a, a couple episodes of Burn Notice, but he wasn't in very much of what I saw. I do remember Briscoe County uh, Jr. in the, the 90s, and I watched a few episodes of that, and I, I liked him. And at that point in time, I knew him from the as the guy from Army of Darkness. And then he's been in like small... I've seen Bubba Hotep. I've seen him in, in smaller roles in other films, and he he you know blends to the back he kind of goes to the background a little bit in those films but i always enjoy him when he's on he seems like he's having fun when he's yep. making these films not so much this one but the the all the other ones he always seems like even though it could be a horrible situation he seems like he's you know enjoying what he's doing most of the time and, and it makes me as watching the film enjoy watching him you know act he has um he f- commits a fashion crime in this, though. Ash is wearing <laughs> oh. lo- loafers. <laughs> He's wearing loafers, and I would call them boat shoes. And then probably is a close-up of them. That's that's a fashion crime. <laughs> Were not those, weren't those hush puppies? Something like that. Yes. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> and I think because it was a low budget, they might have all been wearing their own clothes. So that's even worse. Well, they they described <laughs> something about the shirt he was wearing is that they whatever they made the blood and the the gore out of that he gets doused in at one point in time that he took it off and they put it by the near the fireplace to kind of dry out um and it was still <laughs> and covered. it blew up no it didn't and i thought <laughs> yeah. oh man did it catch on fire and the story is is that once it dried out they went over to pull it off of there and it just fell apart like crumbled it um, broke. It, yeah. It, yeah, broke. Yeah, I think it was like Cairo ky- 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 syrup. I think it was that they used for the blood, and it hardened as it got mm. heated up. Yeah. <laughs> so, and so that uh, they they had to replace his uh, outfit at that point in time. Well, I, I think that would be. This might be a really good time to talk about the making of this film because I think that to me, it, as as a movie file. I, the story is silly enough, and it's a horror movie, and so on. We we get a kick out of it, but it was the passion that these guys all put together to make this movie that I think, to me, is the most legendary part of it. 
it's not necessarily a story as much as what went into it to become what it did. Well, well, Sam Raimi and Bruce Campbell are friends from I want to say high school, if I remember correctly. correct. And yes, that they wanted they wanted to make a, a movie together, and <laughs> that they worked. Uh, you know, they they found a an abandoned cabin, I think in Tennessee. They wanted to use shoot it in Michigan, but they found it in Tennessee. It's an actual abandoned cabin um, that they made this movie on the cheap. Some of the actors are even replaced halfway through the film with stand-ins because they're covered up with so much makeup you can't tell. Mm-hmm. And that Bruce Campbell is as much a part of the crew as he was an actor. That he was moving like the uh, the boat that uh, the that opening shot across the water that Sam Raimi uh, is shooting. He's pushing the boat while Sam Raimi was actually operating the camera. Right. And that they, they this was such a, an an act, a commitment to doing this. Bruce Campbell. It, like sold, I want to say. Yeah, he mortgaged his family's house. Mortgaged his family's yeah. house to get the film um, actually uh, financed, and and uh, and even after the film was done and the crew was released, that uh, he helped Sam Raimi cut it, and they found that they still needed some se- sequences or had to sh- reshoot some sequences, and um, they basically worked to, to, by themselves to get it done. <laughs> so. Yeah. Well, and they created a word that has now become part of Hollywood lexicon is the fake shemp with their their stand-ins of – because they only, they filmed for two months, and then everybody went home. But then they realized they had so many more transition shots that they needed to make, and there weren't any actors. So Sam and Ted and, um, and Bruce basically – stood in doing all kinds of back shots and angled shots and so on that they became the fake shimps that are now used in other movies mm-hmm. yeah what i was going to bring up you mentioned it um to me one of the best effects in this whole movie are the continuous uh pov camera shots that they have where mm-hmm. it's basically the evil or the demons or however you want to look at it and to me those are about as successful as any thing ever done in any horror movie and getting to you feel this entity almost existing just because these guys took uh, cameras and put them on two by fours or whatever and like you said put her on a boat or put her on a motorcycle or just ran with it through the woods whatever it was just to get these shots and these things are great for the little or no money that they used and had to be creative and I always appreciated them for doing this because it, it's been duplicated a million times since. Yeah. But this was genius in how they did it. Well, the angles that he was that he came up with, to me, I, that's mm-hmm. why I, I think I have more appreciation for this movie now, uh, days after watching it. Had I While I was watching it, I didn't have as much I, – I, I saw some cool things, but I didn't have as much appreciation as thinking about it days later. And what I thought about was the art form that they went through to create these shots. Um, the When I was reading about how one of the shots where they're tra- – the Sam, I keep saying Sam, but Bruce and uh, Ellen, uh, Cheryl, I guess the the sister, they were trying to get away in the car, and they ended up parking the car at an angle, put the Mm -hmm. camera on the same angle, and then Bruce got out and walked on level ground, but he looked like he was walking at an angle. And all of those just little things that you wouldn't even think about gave it this eerie, artistic piece of art that we're seeing and that to me was much more impressive like i said than a standard horror movie this was the first to me it was really three genuine well all of them but it's artists on screen and i have a true appreciation for this movie now because of it and like you say and how they use the lighting to like have these very bright lights go either in his face or behind him but yet like you said they take it and they do it at a certain angle so you see the shadows, say, from – you see the shadow under his uh, chin or under his eyes, but yet the light is hitting him directly in the face. It just makes all these scenes very intense and creepy, the way they do all this stuff at these weird angles. And then if you add a little bit of the smoke to it, man, these are some of the creepier scenes in horror history just by how they use their ingenuity to do all this stuff. 
His chin is so big it could black out the Grand Canyon. <laughs> <laughs> now, talk, talking about all that cinematography, that was in my notes. I mean, who would have thought I would have ever watched Evil Dead and taken notes? But um, there was some really great handheld uh, camera work, and you guys have just hit the nail on the head with it, with everything. I can't say anymore. It just that was really good, and you could tell that they were makeshift, but it was effective. Smoke and mirrors. Well, the the budget. Um, I'm, I can't remember Patrick if you brought up the budget of how much it cost to make this movie, but you think about it, they spent as much on this movie as most uh, companies spend on their their food bill. I mean, it's this is done for nothing, and what they came out with at the end was, I think it's a this is a genius with a camera, is why I see. Well, he is a genius. I mean, he has gone on to do much more substantial work, including directing some of the highest grossing films of all time and in a completely different genre and and doing it well and including Bruce Campbell in every single one for one reason. Well, or and this and this is an untrained this is an un, untrained 20-year-old kid that just got a bunch of friends together and some cameras and went out and shot a film. I mean, this is not somebody that's formally trained at UCLA Film School or anything like that. <laughs> I mean, he's th- this is where I think if people that were listening could see how someone can get their start. I mean, we're seeing the first of his real career beginning here and creating something special with it i i my hat's off to this guy well the whole group so well i guess the point to add on to that i read somewhere that the budget and i didn't sorry forgive me patrick if i gave you the wrong number but the budget for this was approximately three hundred and fifty thousand dollars. but yet he went off and eventually made spider-man 3 for 260 million dollars so he eventually grew and grew and grew, but he still, at least to what I read, he appreciates doing that smaller lower, or lower budget movie when being creative versus having all those millions to make what some consider a not so great film. He'd rather make low budget, budget great ones than high budget not so great ones. In my opinion, Spider-Man 3 is the worst Spider-Man film to date. Yeah. Uh, but uh, <laughs> you're right. In between what? those blockbusters, he made a movie that I still really enjoy called A Simple Plan with Billy Bob Thornton, Bill Paxton. That yes. was um, that Very was good a good movie. film, you know. And so he could still stick to that sort of smaller budget, good storytelling as well as the blockbusters. Well, and he also made another one and it came in the 90s, For Love of the Game with Kevin Costner. I think it's an under underappreciated oh, yes. baseball I film. I love that movie. I yes. really liked that film, and I always get surprised when I look back and I go, oh, Sam Raimi directed that? Because it is just not what I've come to, I, especially at that time, come to expect from him. At that point in time, I knew him as the Evil Dead guy, um, even though he did Quicken the Dead. But the Quicken the Dead, it, it, the visual style of it is very reminiscent of the evil dead films is that there's a lot of clever camera angles. There's a lot of uh, just clever use of, uh, you know, the, uh, the idea of like when Gene Hackman gets shot and he can see daylight through his shadow, um, (laughs) which I was like, that's, that to me seems straight out of an evil dead film that, um, that, (laughs) that, but spoiler alert for anyone who hasn't seen that in 22 years, but (laughs) that was uh, Russell, one of Russell Crowe's first First films. Yeah. Russell Crowe, a Leonard, Di- Leonard, Leonard, Leonardo DiCaprio, Gene Hackman. I mean, you Sharon have Stone. Sharon Stone yeah. shot around Tucson. Can you believe that, Shane? The ties that we have to each other. Russell Crowe, <laughs> an Australian, coming all the way to Tucson, filming out here. Unbelievable. He made it a 10-day shoot, didn't he? Yeah, probably. So he could get out of there as soon as possible. Uh, the only other note I had that I wanted to bring up was Stephen King had seen a a screening of this movie and loved it so much that he championed the film and made sure it got bought by New Line Cinema so it would be released. That was one of the cool little aspects or facts I found out there. Yeah, I, re- I for the the video box for years had a quote from him on it, and I'm sure that they trumpeted. I think it was it said "scary as hell" or something like that. I can't remember the exact quote, but it was always that was one of the predominant things on the. Uh, VHS box that I remember in the video store. Yeah, no, Chad's right. I had that in my notes too because at the time Stephen King gave it his stamp of approval, 
And I have the quote in front of me. It says, the most ferociously original horror film of the year. Is that what it says? So, that's pretty huge for someone like him because he was, mm-hmm. you know, he was in his almost, you could say, in his prime as Salem's Lot and Carrie around that time. Yeah. Shining would have been out. Well, the thing that I think is really interesting is about the movie was that during those times that you were just quoting the the names of the movies, you know, Carrie, anything Stephen King. Stephen King is horror to most horror files, I would imagine, at least definitely from the, the 70s, 80s, and 90s. And what I saw here was this is an original story, an original movie, kid actors on a shoestring budget that threw it all together and made it into something that we're still talking about 40 years later and i just find that shocking that it, it's that it's got that kind of legs and i mean what a testament to these folks for what they pulled off all right and it's only, only 35 years later don't make it oh sorry old. so it's <laughs> like 40 years my god has it been 40 years no it hasn't <laughs> so don't they well, yeah, came it, it definitely came at a time when there was a transition of horror film into the mainstream cinema because you would have had Grindhouse and, you know, Splatter movies. But Halloween and Friday the 13th were before this. And even though they were a little bit, they were from studio, they were studio films, I think. Or no, Halloween probably wasn't. Yeah. But that, yeah, it was a transition for horror to sort of become what it is today even uh, even though it's totally different but the smaller budget it wasn't considered grindhouse or a drive-in film evil dead was still considered a a proper movie and that's a feat in itself considering the budget we spoke about and everything else well but it's even different from because the the other horror films of its its contemporary time that the yeah. you know, Halloween launched kind of this slat or not. I want to say launch because essentially Halloween steals from Psycho, which was like nearly twenty years before its release, but creates this kind of slasher genre, which is what I remember predominantly throughout most of the horror films in the eighties. It's you didn't see a lot of vampire films, you didn't see a lot of ghost films, you saw slasher films and some holiday or some you know Mother's Day, you know Valentine's Day, whatever it may be. That's what they would do. And Friday the 13th and Halloween are the prime examples of it. Nightmare on Elm Street comes a few years later. and it's, Prom it's, night. Yeah, prom night. Is, but, you know, even Nightmare on Elm Street is the same thing. It just it evolves it, you know, it just evolves it a little bit. This is very unique in that, that it is not a slasher film in any capacity. It is, it's very gory. But I think this is kind of – this is what leads to something like Hellraiser, which is a film that – a horror film that I really liked in the 80s. Mm-hmm. I, and I have not seen – and I will pre- preface this – since the 80s. <laughs> so <laughs> I have no idea if it would stand the test of time. But I loved it in, in the 80s. But this is, a, is about as close to that as I can think of. And But it is much more big budget it, compared to what they did in Evil Dead with limited means. And it, it's very surprising to me, based off the limited amount of money they had, what they did with the gore and the makeup effects and the special effects in this film. Yeah, other than some of the cheesy stuff with the mannequins and all of that out in, say, the graveyard portion of the woods... I mean, to me, for the most part, the special effects were very well done for what little money they had to spend. So I really appreciate this movie, like you were just saying, Patrick, for being totally different from any of those 80s horror movies and making something unique and original, which, as we've said, is still coming back and being used in this day and age. I mean, look at Cabin in the Woods. I mean, now it's basically... Josh Whedon and Drew Goddard having fun with this movie and doing it in a totally different way. And it's great that this movie is still in the minds of most people out there. Never disappeared. They were looking for a fourth film in the series for years after army of darkness. And essentially what they ended up was getting a remake and then a promise of possibly the remake leading to a joined sequel, which didn't pan out, and then mm. be- and became the television series, which has the sa- it's that's more along Army of Darkness than it is about this film, but it does have a lot of gore in it, that's for sure. Well, I think part of the reason why it has lasted so long is the cast loves this movie. Uh, the, the cast and 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 crew really got behind it and and have continued at all of the comic cons and so on that they continue to go to they're still pushing the evil dead uh 
35 years later. And unlike, I mean, you guys had done a podcast a few weeks ago where one of the stars has completely pushed away from the movie because they didn't get paid or something along those lines. I don't remember the the story, but everybody here associates with the Evil Dead. They actually want it on their resume, and they trumpet it to anybody that who who will listen that I was part of this. And most horror movies, I mean, Johnny Depp, you can't tell me that he wants to be part of the Nightmare on Elm Street type of series this far into his career. These people here 35 years later are still saying, hey, I was the girl that got raped in the, you know, in the Evil Dead. I mean, it's crazy. And also, they're still all working together because I know Raimi puts almost every member of this cast into one of his movies. I know they were in Great and Powerful Oz with James Franco and other uh, other movies that they've done here recently and have brought them back for the Ash vs. Evil Dead TV series. So at least they're one big happy family that's still willing to talk to each other and work together and keep making money together. Yeah, and and that's something I think lacks in Hollywood is the the professionalism and camaraderie, integrity. Of, yeah, of uh, actors. And one of the things that I I respect about Sam Raimi because he does use the same actors, even if it's in just a small role. But he brings back the cast for television shows or you know whatever he wants to do, similar to what like Clint Eastwood did with his stable of actors through like the seventies and eighties and even into the nineties. That you would see the same actors appear into his films because they loved working with them, and it was just I, I liked seeing that. I liked to see like as I said, I enjoy watching people acting and looking like they're having fun and and i hate when i hear about actors who don't get along on the set because yes. gosh i would love to do what you guys do you know like that's <laughs> the simple reality it's like to get to sit around and just work with your friends and play act and make a movie and you know and then go on to the next project and be able to play something else that you know what you do is a treasure and don't don't look past it and you know get too focused on the the uh, the the grind of working a night shoot or having to work with Sharon Stone, you know. That's <laughs> <laughs> I, I think it still happens now. In a sense, a bunch of mates getting together to make a film. They can do it on their iPhones or a little camera. It's just easier for them to do. So the effort for these filmmakers and Sam to round up money for the budget and do what he did was harder back then. And editing is different you know it, it's a feat it really is and for us still to be talking about this movie i mean it's more violent than the texas chainsaw massacre and yeah, the texas yeah. chainsaw massacre is probably equal budget and equally notorious and you touched on the remake i've got to say that that is more repulsive in every way than this 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 film it's hard to watch and that's and i only saw it a few years ago when it actually came out it's but an abomination it's, in my opinion it's hard to watch exactly chad and a lot of people you're right when patrick says it was going to be linked to like a restructure of the original or something because bruce campbell's not in the film but he's like in an extra scene at the end credits which a lot of people missed because people leave before the credits are over so they were going to link it and that's just not going to happen now and they've gone with a tv show which i have to i don't know about you boys but i've never seen one episode i've seen the first two seasons and it's it's in the vein of Army of Darkness. It's 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 tongue in cheek. It's it's primarily comedy. Lots of gore, but much more than like Army of Darkness was. That there's a tremendous amount of gore in it. But I enjoy watching Bruce Campbell in it. Mm-hmm. And of course, it has Lucy Lawless. And <laughs> <laughs> well, the thing that I see that I, I think Shane was just talking about is the the gore factor that is in today's horror films. I think that was the what was. Uh, I, I'm I'm repulsed by today's standards versus, and that's why I don't really watch horror films today. Is because to me it's not horror any longer. It's become offensive, and it's, I'm just I don't have that stomach any longer. And the ones from the 70s, 80s, and 90s that that we're talking about now. To me, at least there was a story involved. It's not about what uh, it's not about the shock factor of how much blood and gore and how if I can get the audience to throw up while watching. Today, it, it, the the old stuff that we're watching right now, the Evil Dead and so on. To me, yes, it was banned in Germany for decades, but it was it, it's 
it, it was meant to be an art form that was meant to entertain, not something that was meant as a shock factor. I was just going to say real quick, and on top of that, to agree with you, it's like Evil Dead using the POV camera and even Halloween and how they approached that movie. Those were movies were more about psychology than they were as thrillers. Horror. Yeah, thriller, exactly. So most of the horror movies nowadays are just about the gore, and they don't, as you said, Bobby, uh, they don't worry about the story, so therefore they don't worry about the psychology of what's going on. And it's weird that you bring up Halloween because uh, I'm on another podcast, um, Movie House Memories, uh, also available on iTunes for download if anybody wants to listen to it. But this month is my pick for one of the, one uh, film for what I think is one of the 100 greatest films, and I picked Halloween. And Halloween, I love that film, and it is not a gore fest. There's very mm-hmm. little blood in the film. I mean, there's very little that makes it R-rated other than there's teenage kids getting killed and a little bit of nudity but it is it is very bloodless and it is it's driven by suspense the most the the almost the entirety of the film similar to what psycho is and that the masterpiece that it became and what it spawned afterwards which became you know just this abundance of you know slasher and slasher gore not gore like this is it's it's really weird to think that that's what it created because everyone was trying to up the ante every single time uh they they released a film and this one has a lot of gore but there's a point behind it where i think as you kind of talked about modern films today like and even not even modern films that i'm thinking now of like saw and hostile and everything like that is like it just takes it to an extreme level where it's it's not suspenseful, it's not scary, it's just gross, you know. And I, I don't take any joy out of trying watching the film. In fact, I find it a chore. Just a, okay, can we get past this so you can get back to the story? So maybe you might hook me. And not to, mm-hmm. and although I will say the first saw was really good. It just got bizarre, and every time after that it got worse. Hostel was just horrible from the the get go. <laughs> It's just torture porn is yeah. all it is. It's torture porn for freakazoids out there who want to watch this stuff. So, I mean, I I like a good horror movie that has a good story and a good psychology, like a Halloween or, as you said, Psycho or this movie. I mean, they're great, uh, but when people just want to see death for the sake of seeing death or gore for the sake of seeing gore, it just – I worry about those people. So that's just my opinion. Well, you remember – long ago in the early 90s when the um what were the snuff films that came out that they were banned worldwide because they were obviously <laughs> not the things they should be watching faces Today, of death are you talking about ahead. faces of death faces of death thank you the, the today they're all but snuff films, and yep. I think that's that's why I'm struggling with them today. Is because I it, it if I want to see that you know, to be honest with you, well I, I would never want to see that, but. I just don't see the draw. Amen. I, I see everything, all the newer films. I go back and watch a lot of the older stuff for work. And you're right. It's The genres have changed in many ways with Hostel and Saw, but there's something about the Saw movies I didn't mind. They, were, they had their idiosyncrasies, I guess, and they were violent and just for the sake of it, but they had a little bit of twisted uh, logic to them to, if that makes sense but it's the it's the horror you don't see or is more effective like two examples recent ones are lights out and don't breathe they're really good thriller horrors and it's what you don't see that makes it more yes. scary yes it's a psychological like chad was just saying is it when yeah. you're de- when you're dealing with the brain rather than look, dealing with the eyes i think you're going to be it, much more challenged as using your um, intellect, and I think those are wonderful movies. And it, and if you can really tap into it, and I think that's where the Evil Dead did. I think they not only used the the gory visuals, but they would have the evil that was outside. It would come at them and stop, and then it would attack from a different angle and stop, and then it would attack and then full on come into somebody, and then it would disappear. And it was just all those. Where is it? Is it going to show up now? You know. It, that's the cool stuff to me, and that's why I think it's lasted so long. Is my brain enjoys the challenge that goes along with it, rather than just here. It's in your face. It's in your face. It's in your face. Movie's over. Go home. And I've never seen it, but apparently, Evil Dead the musical is still running strong. 
<laughs> it's still, it still travels the country, and if you sit in the first three rows, you're guaranteed to get splattered with blood. <laughs> Does like someone have a prosthetic chin? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. All right, let's wrap it up. What do we think, boys? Uh, does Evil Dead stand the test of time? Although I've got a feeling we've already telegraphed our punches in this case. <laughs> Bobby? Yes. I, I, like I said, I've never seen it before. To me, I I, I really like the movie. Um, t- I, to be honest, I don't know if I'll watch it again for a while simply because I'm just not a horror fan. But it, if anybody were to ask me whether this is worth watching, I would absolutely say yes because just for the ability to see passion on screen – I, I I admire that. Um, you've got really good actors. Well, <laughs> they were learning, but a, a really good group of people that are trying their best to put a story in front of us. It's a little gory, but not based on today's standards. It's just I, I think it's fun. I, I definitely can't be. I Bruce Campbell is worth watching any time in a movie to me just because of the humor factor even though this is very much downplayed compared to, to the, the sequels I very much like this movie I think it has lasted 35 years for a reason not just because the cast is involved but because it's a decent movie and yes I think it has stood this, the test of time and would definitely recommend it for the next 35 years Chad? Uh, yeah, I'll agree. This one definitely has stand, stood the test of time, and I think it'll stand the test of time for the next 30-whatever years. To me, anybody who enjoys this type of movie should watch it, and if you're not even a fan of the movie when you watch it, at least look at how they made the film and appreciate how they took a shoestring budget and turned it into a very entertaining film that has stood the test of time for three decades. Shane. Well, except for Ash wearing those boat shoes, the, the, the film <laughs> stands the test of time. The film definitely stands the test of time. It's a genre staple. I hadn't seen it for a long time. I enjoyed watching it again. It brought back memories and also brought back some new stuff that I'd totally forgotten. I don't get the whole pop culture phenomenon of it, though. You know, from musicals to TV shows to remakes and that. I mean. You know, Hollywood always wants to re- wants to remake something that's popular, but I don't get that. It's still good. I would recommend it for young filmmakers and horror enthusiasts to watch if they've never seen it, like Bobby and Patrick. And it's got a great name, The Evil Dead. That's, to the point, just a great, catchy name. I like it. And that wasn't the original name, by the way. That's what was interesting. Book of what the was Dead. It? it was called Book of the Dead. It was the Book of the uh, Dead, yeah. The uh, producer gave them the opportunity to pull it. Didn't know that. Yeah, because okay. they didn't think kids would want to go see a film that said, had the word book in it. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. There has to be a naysayer. Without a doubt, it stands the test of time. I did not like this film. I did not. I did not enjoy the film at all. It was a chore to get through. And I like the other two films, obviously, since I own them. I really like Evil Dead 2. I really like Army of Darkness. I enjoy watching Ash versus the Evil Dead on Stars. I I was like I was excited about oh I've never seen it. I always meant to see it. And then watching it, I went, eh, all right. I I, I can't believe this was that big a deal. I mean, because other than it was the first and i'm i'm seeing it in reverse order and that's my problem with it but if if someone were to come to me and say hey i'm thinking about watching thinking about watching the evil dead series i tell them to start with two go to three watch ash versus the evil dead then go back and watch one because if you watch one you may not make it to the second one because and (laughs) (laughs) because i i just didn't think it was as that captivating it seemed long to me and it wasn't and it's a very simple storyline and it was just like can we get to it can we get to it can we get to it and i was i was getting a little frustrated but would you watch it again in a different setting just to look at the stuff we've been talking about in the filmmaking process you know and that that's the, the it's kind of to steal something from matt and jason when we talked about blade runner years ago in the podcast uh that the the story of the film is a little more interesting to me than the story of the uh, in the film. And I agree. Like the Blade Runner, you know, like all of Chris and, Chris and I worship the ground Blade Runner was walked on, 
<laughs> Matt and Jason hated the film, but thought it was fascinating. Everything that had been written about, talked about, discussed, how people theorize about the film is much more interesting than the actual film itself to them. And that, that what you say, the, the logistics of it, you know, I was watching it on a computer screen at work while I was eating lunch. So it wasn't, you know, I wasn't getting that full vis- you know, s- you know, visual experience. And I was watching it to get the storyline and kind of f- understand what was going on. So I didn't look at it from that perspective. So it's probably worth watching it from another perspective. I ain't going to do it this week. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you know, maybe sometime when I'm not eating something and uh, that, uh, <laughs> I-, I can sit down. eating cottage cheese by chance. Oh, yeah. Oh, what, what, where's my Kiro <laughs> syrup? So uh, that <laughs> that I might go back and watch it for the, from the filmmaking perspective, because th- that, you know, I was, I, I'd read that a little bit after I watched the film. I'd read some more about this, you know, the, the pre-production stuff. Cause I didn't want to read about the story so I can just appreciate the story. But, you know, reading about some of the, the camera angles and stuff came after I'd watched it. And I was like, yeah, I didn't, ca- I didn't catch that when I was watching it, but I'd be much more curious to now having heard all that, what I would think of the film at this point. Patrick, that's watching it on a computer screen, eating know. lunch at work is like going to the movies and just keep checking your phone. You can't concentrate. <laughs> yeah, no, I, well, I I could concentrate a little bit better than going to the movies and checking my phone, but it's it, yep. when I have little kids in the house and they're usually up, it's going to be hard for me to sit down and watch The Evil Dead. It <laughs> is true, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's... You know, I, my my son's getting a little bit up there, and I'm very excited about the films he can watch. But you know, going that would have been a way too far for him at this point in time, and then I'd get yelled at by my wife. All right, that does it for this week's review of The Evil Dead. Thanks again for joining us and listening to our little weekly podcast. If you've had a good time, the fun doesn't have to stop here. You can follow us on Facebook at Lunchtime Movie Review or on Twitter at Lunchtime Movie. On either Facebook or Twitter, you can keep up on our written film reviews, news on upcoming films and Blu-ray, re- and Blu-ray releases, and information on upcoming podcasts on the MHN Podcast Network, including The Golden Age of the Silver Screen, Movie House Memories, Mail Bonding, The Number Two Review, and Movie House Concessions. Again, if you've enjoyed yourselves and you've downloaded us off either iTunes or Stitcher, make sure to rate our podcast on either one of those two platforms. And if you have a chance, write a short review of the podcast. Of course, we always like the reviews that are positive, but we appreciate any feedback that we can get from any listeners of the show. Well, that does it for this episode of Lunchtime Movie Review. Until next time, I'm Patrick. I'm Bobby. I'm Chad. And I'm Shane. And I'm impressed I didn't have to remind you guys what the order was. That That's called professionalism right there. <laughs> Thank you, sir. We got to get out of here right now, and you're inv- and you guys are invited. This podcast is not endorsed by Sony Pictures Home Entertainment. It is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. The Evil Dead, all names and sounds of the Evil Dead characters, and any other The Evil Dead related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Sony Pictures Home Entertainment and or their respective trademark and or copyright holders. All original content of this podcast is the intellectual property of the MHN Podcast Network. Lunchtime Movie Review, and Fuzzy Bunny Slippers Entertainment, LLC, unless otherwise noted.